The topic for today is slightly abstract. Rather than discussing a specific game or new release, I want to highlight a growing problem in the space, which, without beating around the bush here, is oversensitivity. This is not unique to gaming, the problem is affecting almost every single area of online interaction at the moment, but the channel focuses on gaming, so that is where I will direct the video. The question now is what do I mean by oversensitivity? I don't mean anything mechanical, and contrary to the first impression many will have, I don't even really mean developmental or creative sensitivity either. The sensitivity problem most prominently comes from viewers, players, and most importantly, media. To set the stage, here is a clip from an animations talk hosted at GDC by a staff editor for Kotaku named Heather Alexandra. GDC, for those that do not know, is the Game Developers Conference. But we need to be careful because players are tyrants. Um, I know we're supposed to say like players are the best and everything, but players scare the shit out of me. They control everything about video game worlds. They can make these people, and I mean it, these people do things that they do not want to do. Um, the implications of that are very scary. I think video game characters want freedom, and thankfully there are places where they get it. Thankfully, yes. Um, cutscenes is one place where they actually get to act as like, entities solely within their fictional world, by which I mean they just get to be people, and then idle animations where they finally get to express just for a moment, a little autonomy. This clip is a perfect starting point for today's discussion, and I'll link the entire talk down below for those that want to watch the rest, but for right now, I will focus in on one particular theme, and that theme is the idea that video game characters are people with their own motivations, goals, and desires, while players are tyrants exerting problematic control over these people when their goals do not align. The entire talk feels very panicked. I'm not attempting to degrade the speaker here, it could just be a result of nerves, I'm not sure, but at least to me, on a very subjective level, she feels frail, nervous, and quite panicked. The voice fluctuations, the tone, and inflection all suggest a very skittish mindset, and again, this is pure speculation here, but that sense of fear while discussing how players are tyrannical forces oppressing video game characters, characters that are repeatedly referenced as real people, by the way, sets up a very difficult barrier for me to cross in terms of conceptual value. This is not a developer giving a presentation on creative process and animation methodology from personal experience. This is, as far as I can tell, a staff writer from a major video game news publication presenting a talk on what is realistically a very small section of game design with far-reaching conceptual assertions. The central idea is that players are tyrants who exert often unwanted control over a video game character and that these characters deserve better. Now, there is value in the concept of micro animations, to be sure. On that, we should all obviously agree. The small moments in a game where scripted events unfold which develop a player's sense of immersion or teach us about their personality are extremely valuable fragments of the overall experience. But there is a difference between discussing the importance of these moments and assigning a sense of victimhood to video game characters as as a whole as if they were people. They are both actors, by which I mean that they are controllable persona manipulated by players, and they're characters, by which I mean individuals within a fiction, but also like people in a world, and we need to start treating them like actual people. Um, because they're being pulled in these two different directions, there's conflict though. Um, what Raiden wants as a character in Metal Gear Solid 2 is incredibly different than what a player might want for Raiden at any given time. Um, and because video game characters are fulfilling two roles, it's a problem. Here's an example of that. On the left, there is a YouTuber who is making a compilation video of all the death animations in Resident Evil 2. The objective here for the actor is to die over and over. Claire Redfield's objective as a character is to live. These two things are not compatible. That's super screwed up. But good news, these two things can align. Solid Snake wants to sneak through a base and he wants to complete his mission. The player wants to not get spotted and get the highest rank at the end of the game. Great, things are in alignment. Find the moments where your characters can break free from player tyranny and emphasize them. Um, you won't just have moments where your characters find relief, your players will find relief with your characters and your games will be kinder. And I think that's something we all need right now in this world, it's just a little bit of kindness. So uh, there you go. The fundamental concept of kindness is not something I would ever scoff at, but the framing for emphasizing kindness by subtracting from player tyrannical control in order to improve the game overall is stepping outside the realm of reason and even reality. During the presentation, Overwatch is discussed, more specifically the reloading animation that Tracer utilizes, so let's shift gears here and turn towards the recently announced update for Overwatch and its newest character. Sigma is a mad scientist being introduced into the Overwatch universe, but his mere existence as a white male archetype has angered more people than is reasonable. 
In reality, Overwatch is probably one of the most progressively diverse video games in history, but the simple addition of this character, even though it is the first addition of a white male archetype since the game's initial release, has sparked a level of backlash that is completely unjustified. This brings us to the problem of active versus passive community participation. The vast majority of players in Overwatch do not give a single shit about the sexuality, ethnicity, or origin stories for these characters. The overwhelming majority of gamers are interested in ability strength, meta mechanics, team composition, and gameplay features such as map design and various modes. They do not care about the character archetype and its framing against real world politics and social narratives. However, despite this huge and overwhelming majority of gamers that are not interested, there is a very small but viciously vocal group that do care, and they are relentless in their pursuit of influencing what the game contains, with the goal of transforming it into a construct that fits precisely into their own personal subjective universe of oversensitivity. We see it all over social media as well, new words being added to filters or new parameters placed on exposure. A good example would be the word cuck on YouTube, a derivative of the word cuckold, which typically means the husband of an adulteress, and references the cuckoo bird, which would lay its eggs in another bird's nest. It has now been blanket moderated, and even comments from many months ago containing the word were all retroactively purged into suspended cues because the word was deemed offensive by an overly sensitive individual or committee. I'm not really sure what happened, um, but they just happened to be in a position of power on the platform and decided to do that. The vast majority of viewers or players do not care about comments that contain the word cuck, or the color of an Overwatch character's skin, or whatever else, but the ones that do care are working tirelessly to change products and realign those designs within their ever-fluctuating subjective narrative. On a very basic level, working to change something in a way that is appealing to you is not wrong, I'm not saying that it is, but when those changes involve a redefinition of video game characters, such as the staff writer from Kotaku stated during her presentation, and that redefinition now classifies them as actual people, what kind of logical progression now follows? The problem of oversensitivity is something that can do nothing but damage everything it intersects with. It is one thing to criticize a game for having faulty mechanics or a glitchy experience, even for having a poorly written story or an unfulfilling concept, but when you project that criticism out to such an extreme that you break down the barrier of game versus reality, and by extension start applying the cryptic, ever-progressing political and social trends of modern day society to those characters as if they are anything other than a collection of pixels, it becomes a quagmire so impossible to navigate, it would destroy what little integrity is left within the games industry. Picture two separate game development projects in side-by-side -side identical realities, apart from a set of key differences for the actual development. In one of those projects, the prime directive is that the game be restricted from ever offending anyone or anything for any reason at any time. And additionally, the players that game is being created for are regarded as tyrants, and an emphasis is placed on allowing the video game characters, who are regarded as real people, the freedom to express themselves independent from the tyrannical control of the player, to whom this game is meant to appeal because that control is inhumane. The resulting paradox conflicts with what video games even are. If the game contains humor, it can be offensive. If it contains tragedy, it can be offensive. If it contains heroism with any real world reference at all, it can be offensive. To adhere to those principles, they must reduce player choice and limit player control, but those are two of the primary driving motivations behind gaming itself. The end result of unflinching and enforced hypersensitivity is destruction of logic and functionality. What we see is internalization. If I reflect back on my own childhood and my earlier experiences with gaming itself, there are plenty of memories where the priority was on building up a thick skin and a sense of individualism. If someone didn't like the same things that I did, who cares? But the issue that seems to have become more and more entrenched as of late is the internalization of that criticism and an inability to cope with anything that is uncomfortable. When I say that game is bad because of X or Y or Z, the response is often emotional, and a great many players somehow arrive at the conclusion that because they do like that game, and I don't, that I therefore dislike them, and my criticism of that game by default means that I am criticizing them as an individual because their own individuality is self-associated with the game. The minuscule vocal minority that seeks to remove anything subjectively offensive from not only their own sightlines, but from existence entirely, is indeed a much smaller group. But they are far more active, and the effort to mitigate their effect is much more passive. The reason behind this is because when you label a cause as just or moral, even if in reality it's not always true, you immediately project that your opponents are unjust and immoral. 
If a group of players or journalists begin to call for an increase in diversity within Overwatch, citing historical injustice or prejudice along the way, they set up a trap for anyone who tries to counter-argue that the game only needs to have fun character abilities, good maps, and decent balancing. By disagreeing with them for any reason at all, even ones that are disconnected and valid, they can suddenly say that by failing to conform to their self-professed ideological interpretation of how games should be, based on their moral interpretation or whatever it is, you are therefore prejudicial as a person. This is not a fun label to have assigned to you. I myself have been called alt-right many different times simply because I argued against the forced inclusion of political themes in video games, especially when they are only a tactic to reduce criticism by overly sensitive players or media, and they end up adding zero value to the game's story or experience. This is not to say that politics cannot be a wonderful addition to a game, perhaps, but when themes are inserted just to appease sensitivity and potential disagreement, the likelihood of that happening bottoms out. The new Overwatch character, Sigma, is a mad scientist, but that concept could be deemed as offensive to those with mental disabilities. As one Twitter user pointed out, it could be perceived as a caricature of dissociative identity disorder. And by the logic of oversensitivity and safe space culture, it therefore cannot be allowed into the game and should not exist. The disconnect, and where it becomes impossible to reason with overly sensitive emotional people, is that when you embrace this mindset, you are forced to just start removing entire sections of society as we know it. Some vegans find meat to be offensive. No more meat. Comedy almost always has a recipient. No more comedy of any kind. No more education of history because learning about those events could trigger someone. And no more video games because weapons, violence, sex, or whatever else, all of the things that make a good video game, honestly, could offend someone. The pointed and repeated effort to call video game characters real people and human beings is extremely troubling to me, because an extension of real-world hypersensitivity regarding human behavior and treatment would destroy an industry already teetering on the brink of disaster. Players must be given increasing control over their own experience, in direct contrast to what the Kotaku staff writer said during her presentation, and that control must then be respected and preserved rather than embracing a top-down moderation technique. Hypersensitivity often results in a desire for a powerful overarching entity, often the government, but in this case for gaming specifically, publishers or developers, to forcefully create an environment that restricts what players are or are not allowed to do or say because hypersensitive individuals can't handle it. However, this is an imperfect, restrictive, and constantly tightening solution that leads in a single direction and results in the destruction of creative process, individual freedoms, and autonomy. Giving players increased choice and control over their own subjective experience, while it may result in some overly sensitive people having to grapple with the inevitable truth that what they want others to do and think might not always happen, is a healthier and more sustainable way to foster societal interactions. Effectively, the current trend of trying to always be nice to one another, or when that formality is lacking, forcing others to be nice by requirement, is damaging. When players take control of their own experience with the tools to effectively do so, it will lead to a much better environment for both gamers and developers. That's it for today, though. If you want to support the channel, please consider the Patreon down below, and there are other links as well, but I'll cut it there and stop rambling. As always, thank you all for watching, and have a nice night.